I have a few announcements, and uh, while I'm making these announcements, you are listening at home. Uh, if you hear the doorbell or a knock on the door in the next couple of minutes, that's the ushers. It's taken us a few weeks to get that organized, but we're there. I'm kidding. I just made that up. We do have uh, an email going around. All of you should have received an email by now talking to you about our online budget vote, uh, asking you if you are in favor of an online budget vote. Uh, because we are already uh, almost two months into our new fiscal year, and uh, we need to um, approve a provisional budget for the church and uh, ultimately for the school. And because um, we're not quite ready to have our annual meeting, though our uh, reopening committee is working very hard to get that and everything else in place, uh, we are asking uh, for you to weigh in are you uh, okay with an online vote uh, to approve a provisional budget? And uh, most of you have already voted. If you haven't, please, uh, please respond to that email and let us know uh, what your opinion is about that. We want to move forward with that. I'm also happy to say I just got word this morning from our beloved Pastor John that it looks like uh, we will be meeting together in our sanctuary this coming Sunday. Yeah. Now, um, you want to watch closely for any information to come out this week by email. It won't be quite what you're used to. Uh, there will still be some, um, some guidelines that we're going to have to follow, some limitations. And uh, so watch for information about that. Please continue to pray for our reopening committee. Uh, they are working very hard and very well, uh, even to get us to this point. We're excited about that. And uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me now uh, in a word of prayer uh, as we continue in our worship time together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for a beautiful day to meet uh, here outdoors in your house, in your, I guess, in your backyard. Uh, you invited us to the backyard today uh, for a party. And uh, you're the guest of honor, and thank you for making it a beautiful day for us to enjoy you together. Uh, we're glad to be with one another. I'm thankful, Father, that we're still able to be uh, online for those who couldn't make it here today, uh, for those who are tuning in from out of the region, for those who are um, at home and uh, not quite ready to uh, rejoin us. Lord, we understand that everybody's in a different place, and uh, we want to be patient with one another. Thank you for the work that our reopening committee has been doing and is doing. Uh, Lord, I know it's a lot of work for our worship team to set up outdoors, for all of the volunteers that have been uh, working hard just to be able to have this uh, hour and a half together out, outdoors, and uh, there will be some significant time spent afterwards to put everything away again. Uh, so, Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you to you, and thank you for putting into the hearts of your, of your family uh, to do this for us. We appreciate it. Lord, we want to lift up Is Isabel Rabotham, who wasn't feeling well this week, and ask for prayer. Not only do we pray, Lord, that she feels better, but we pray, Lord, that you strengthen her so that uh, her desire uh, to worship together with her church family here in this place, in this building, that you would grant her that request, that you would fulfill that wish for her. And, uh, Lord, may, may that happen sooner than later. We also want to lift up Earlene Schoomaker's uh, grandson, Thomas, a little boy, who underwent uh, serious surgery this week and is recovering in critical condition. We pray, Lord, that you would give him the help that he needs. We pray also, Lord, that you would give to his family what they need and strengthen the medical team that's caring for him. Give them wisdom, give them care and skill. Lord, I want to lift up our graduates, those who have already graduated from area high schools, 
those uh, from Harmony Christian School who will be graduating this coming Friday night. Uh, Lord, it's been a most unusual year for our seniors, uh, but thank you for patience and endurance and perseverance, and we pray your blessing on them uh, as they have passed this milestone, as they gather with family and friends to celebrate, and as they look forward to what is coming next for them. And now, Lord, we pray for this next moment as we give our attention to you and to your word as you deliver it to us by your servant, our pastor, John. We thank you for him and pray for him and for his wife, Sherry, as they continue to lead us and minister to us. Give them skill, give them health and strength, and give them joy in the service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome to Harmony Baptist Church's very first tailgate service. For those of you who have open cans that uh, reflect cores on the side, please put them away for the viewing audience so that uh, we don't corrupt them in any way. That was a joke for those who are listening. I don't see any. But uh, thank you for enduring. I have one request from the F and F team. Can we do something about the air conditioning today? Woo! Last week I had my jacket on the entire time and I was comfortable. And this time I have this shirt on and I'm still not comfortable. But anyway, it's warm. Welcome, and uh, let me mention something about that. I'm wearing this shirt not as a social commentary, although we are concerned for what's happening in our culture, and we're concerned for what uh, we as a church and as uh, pastors were processing. How do we manifest a stand for justice and righteousness in our culture? And we're going to be working through that. But I'm wearing this shirt today in honor of one year ago, if anybody remembers, I see some of my fellow travelers in the studio audience. Yay, fellow travelers. Thank you, Carolyn. I also, nice hat, Dave. I like it. Anyway, your lovely wife was with us, and uh, we went over to Kenya and uh, had a wonderful time and got to know those people, especially out in Limeru which we expected from Pastor Oscar, uh, Bishop Oscar, was going to be hard hit um, by this coronavirus disaster. And so we, Harmony, have contributed. Uh, our elder Corey McGrail last week mentioned that we had already sent some funding. Uh, finally, I got that wonderful personal letter from President Trump. Did anybody else get one of those? I'm special. All right. Maybe not, but anyway, uh, so I've sent mine on, and I'm just bringing this to us today to remind us we have one more week. At the end of the month, we're going to wrap that up and finish our extra above and beyond giving. Don't put yourself in a difficult place, but if God prompts you above and beyond giving, I know that Harmony alone has probably helped them through more than one of the three months that they were going to struggle through. So way to go, Harmony. Very good job. Thank God for those who are uh, sensitive to that, and you are giving people. Praise God. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of other quick, quick things to mention. One is I'm on the back of this truck. You know, God has a sense of humor. My Father in heaven has a sense of humor. I hope, well, you, all you have to do is look at some animals and uh, sometimes even some people. Anyway, he's got a sense of humor. Last week, some, somebody asked me, we couldn't tell when we were watching the stream what you referenced. Well, motorcycles went by, and I went, oh, luckies. And uh, so this last week, I went for a ride, and uh, I'm on the back of this truck because the last time I saw my motorcycle, thank you, Brian, it was on the back of this truck getting towed. That's what I get for lusting after a motorcycle ride. So anyway, God has a sense of humor. And there we go. Nobody worry about it. We'll all be fine. Today is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you fathers. Yes. And by the way, you deserve some applause, and I hope that will become self-evident as we push through the word today. I also uh, was told that nobody would see this. I don't know if that's true, but there's this poofy little thing on my... Uh, my uh, microphone to keep the wind from being a problem, and it looks like a tribble. 
For all of you Star Trek fans, I just want to acknowledge Mr. Nywinning, I'm holding you accountable. Uh, the trouble with tribbles. Hopefully we won't have any trouble with this tribble today. All right, I got the thumbs up from the sweaty guy. All right, <laughs> so you'll notice in your bulletin if you printed one out, and I hope you do that, and if not, um, I'm going to quote the verses as we go, give you the references, and if I forget, um, my favorite brother who I already picked on, Bob Nywinning, will say, speak into the microphone, say the the reference again if I forget. I'm talking today about the Father's Day gift. Now think about the best gifts you ever get. I don't know what your best gifts are. I, uh, I, for me, Father's Day is kind of low key. We have too much activity. We have five children. There's so much going on. I'm happy if I get a $25 uh, gift card to Lowe's. That'll, that'll set me up, I'm fine. I don't worry. But other times of the years, we look forward to special kinds of gifts. And um, I don't know what you think of as your favorite gifts. I always think of that wonderful Christmas movie. It's hard to think of Christmas in this heat. But uh, Ralphie gets the best gift he could ever get or ever would get. And that was his Red Rider carbon action BB gun with this compass in the stock on a thing that tells time. Go watch the movie anyway. And then there are gifts you don't want to get. I, uh, I thought about people, and I've heard people say, oh, I got my uh, friend over here a special gift. I bought him a dog. Okay, I didn't get any reaction on that. So just so you know, if you buy me a dog, you won't be my friend. Okay, because not because I don't like dogs, I just don't have the time or energy to take care of them. And so that's the kind of gift that keeps on giving. Kind of like the year 2020, I've heard, the year that keeps on giving, right? Keep having drama. But whatever your gift is that you look forward to, uh, think about the joy that it gave you to receive it. I tell one story. I've told it once in our history here. I'm going to mention it again, and that is I come from a home where my grandmother grew up in the Depression, and my mom was part of that. Now, those of you who are Depression kids, any of you out there, you know that you never get rid of anything. You don't throw things away if they still work. Well, that's not true as much today, but let me just give you the context. So years ago, sitting in our living room up north, north in the state, uh, our kids were all watching the Chronicles of Narnia on our television, a wonderful color television where all the snow in Narnia was pink. Because that TV really needed to go to Never Never Land and be replaced. But I am a second generation from the Depression, so you don't get rid of it. It still works. Your imagination can tell you that the snow really shouldn't be pink. Well, my kids didn't put up with that. So one, I believe it was Christmas. I can't remember exactly. I think it was they surprised me with this awesome 1080p, all the whole works, you know, flat screen, the, like we use today, like you people have. And so I finally had one. In fact, I'm still using it today in Pine Bush. Wonderful television, wonderful gift. And my kids were ecstatic because they pulled it off. I had no idea I was getting this wonderful replacement. And it brought joy to my heart, and it brought joy to them in the process of giving. Those of you know who have experienced it understand the joy it brings to the person who receives as well as to those who give it. Well, with that in mind, I want to talk about the, the ultimate, if you will, Father's Day gift. And if you've read the text, you know where I'm going. It's in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. Yes, I can make Hebrews fit any holiday of the year, guaranteed. Here we go. Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 10. Follow along. Therefore, when he, Jesus, comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Well, that's going to need some explanation. Then I said, this is a prophetic reference from the book of Psalms. Then I said, behold, I have come in the role of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, 
Thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them, parentheses, which are offered according to the law which God gave them. He said, Behold, I have come to do thy will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this we will have been sanctified. By the way, that word means permanently sanctified, set apart for eternity. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Key phrase, the gift that Jesus gives his father, behold, I have come to do thy will. A reference to a prophetic psalm about the Messiah, Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, just in case you wanted to know where it came from. The best gift ever. What is the best gift? When I talk to my children and they say, what do you want for Father's Day or what do you want for Christmas or whatever, I do often respond, the best thing you can give me is living the right way, is doing what is right. In fact, in the book of 3 John, chapter 1, verse 4, that shepherd, that pastor, John the Apostle, says this, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. And from my chair as a shepherd for 44 years, both my actual physical children as well as my spiritual children, when they walk in the truth, that gives me the best joy, the greatest gift imaginable. Now think about that as a child of God. What gives your Father in heaven the greatest joy? should be able to do the math. It's not about the check in the plate. It's not about even coming on a Sunday per se. It's that whole thing of obedience, and it's going to be pointing out that it comes from the heart. When I was a younger father and I was raising my kids, I understand our youth group is going through the book of Proverbs, right, Ryan? Yay, great book. We taught our children a few of the Proverbs to memorize, and one was this. It said, my sons, my daughter, and by the way, everywhere tonight that talks, about, okay, this is morning. Every time this morning we talk about sons, it's sons and daughters, all right, the children of God. My children, when young toughs entice you, say no to them. Don't consent. Say no to those who try to tempt you to do wrong. We used to teach them to do right. That is what brings joy to a father's heart. Well, let me park for just one quick minute on the actual gift that we're looking at. And if you did write out your notes, you know that it says the actual gift is soteriological. Write that one down. You can use it all week and show off. I'm selling it to you for 50 cents, right? Soteriological. And here's what it means, salvation. Those of you who know the little ichthys symbol for Christians or for Christianity, the, the acrostic is Jesus Christ, in Greek, Jesus Christ, God's Son, and soter, Savior. Soteriological means salvation. The actual gift that the Son gave the Father was to save us, to rescue us, to make us his, her, his, make us his children by a personal faith relationship. When it says... Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired. It doesn't mean that God didn't want the Old Testament obeyed. Of course he wanted it obeyed. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given those rules. But the principle that is being communicated is that God was looking for more than simply that sacrifice in itself. Soteriological. It is a salvation gift that Jesus gave to his father. Let me read it to you out of the book of John. John, the 8th chapter, 28 through 29. Jesus is saying, when you lift up the Son of Man, does anybody picture what he's saying? When you lift up, any, do I get a witness? Anybody? Witness? When you lift up the Son of Man on the cross, when you lift him up, then you will know that I am he. I'm the one who came to do the Father's bidding to give him the ultimate Father's Day gift. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. And here's the key. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. 
Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. First and foremost, this gift is soteriological. It is salvation. It's the finished work of Christ on your behalf. I'm going to read something from one of our commentators named Lang, just so that you can hear the point driven home. The priest in Israel might attend to the utmost diligence and scrupulous care to the God-directed duties of his sacred office, but he could not secure the one all-important result, doing the will of God completely. All the sacrifices he might offer during those 30 years of service failed to attain that end. The one true end of our existence, which is also the one essential secret, get this, friends, the secret to true happiness. What is the chief end of man? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. The secret of true happiness is doing the will of God perfectly and always. This the sinner cannot do. Anybody relate? I'm a sinner. I can't pull it off. Anybody want to say amen? I can't do it. What is to be done? The Son of God gives the answer. Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God. I will do for you what no one else can do. Do you get it? If you've accepted Christ, if he is your Savior, the work is finished. You don't have to earn it. You're already in. Now you want to enjoy my second point, which is giving God the gift he's really looking for. So we'll unpack that next. Jesus fulfills this gospel for us, and now we believe in the one that was sent on our behalf. This leads us to the heart issue. <clears throat> Those of you who remember the book, The Prodigal God, which I highly recommend by Tim Keller, he makes a distinction between two sons from the father. The prodigal son we know because he ran off and lived a raunchy life. We know he was a bad boy. But the other son, the older son, he did everything right. And yet he was also alienated from his father. He was actually angry with his father for receiving the other son back when he repented. He was alienated, even though he did everything right. Are any lights coming on? The prophet said, this people draws near with their lips, but their... What? Heart is far from me. Jesus said the Father is looking for true worshipers, worshiping in spirit and in truth. I have five kids. Some of them had experiences growing up where they encountered, I know this is going to be hard to believe, they encountered Christians who weren't living it. Can you imagine such a thing? One of them actually worked for some Christian companies, Christian, I'm putting them in quotes on purpose. They're listed in the Christian yellow pages. I'm not, I'm not going to let my ADD take me down that path. Let me just say, he worked for one of these companies who went to church and looked right on the outside, but in their business practices, they were always one step behind what was legal. They were driving illegal vehicles. They were breaking rules left and right. He would scratch his head and say, what's going on? That's what you call drawing near with your lips, but being far in your heart. A heart obedience that wants to please the father who's watching. Whether the cops pull me over and figure it out or not is irrelevant. What matters is, am I doing what my father in heaven ultimately wants? The desirable gift, number two, your desirable gift is psychological. Soteriology, salvation is settled. But what goes on in your psyche, what goes on inside of you, inside the giver, that's what God is looking for. A loving, trusting, obedient heart. The inner thoughts and motives. Jesus could say, I always do what pleases my father. Now, I have to go on record. I don't always pull that off. And I have a feeling you would all agree with me that you don't as well. Nevertheless... I have to confess that because of the new birth within me, there is a joy of knowing when you do actually get it right and you know that you've pleased the Father, that is second to nothing. And our Father delights in that. And boy, what a great Father's Day gift to give him every day is Father's Day on that line, every day. 
So I know it's Father, Father's Day, and Father's Day elicits various emotions. Many of you in the uh, parking lot here today or listening online, um, you are well-fathered. Uh, you can almost smell it when people, especially sons, have been well-fathered. And you can also sense it when some of the uh, modeling of mom and dad, and especially dad, has gone awry and they've done it um, imperfectly, you can smell that brokenness as well. You know, we're all trying to do our best parenting, and uh, we tried to do our best, and we certainly made mistakes. We got some things right, thank God. We also missed some things. You're in the same boat, and God will support us. I'm going to get to that in a couple of minutes, but let me just say, depending on your context, your response to the Heavenly Father is either easy or difficult, depending on what you had modeled and how much damage or grace was imparted from your father. Tons of rebellion, confusion, senses of rejection, unresolved anger, gender confusion, all of that can come from having the wrong signals at home. On the other hand, having an involved father and mother, but father especially, has an impact that is second to nothing. Even if they're imperfect, being there is better than not being there. I'm not going to park on my circumstance because many of you have heard it before. I come from a very broken background. Others, not so much. But I want to go on record that my Father in heaven is a good, good Father, as we sang this morning, and he can make up the difference of what has been lacking in your spirit, whoever we are. He can make the difference. And I'm speaking with personal experience because in spite of being fatherless, he fathered me. And I mean that literally. I had to cast myself on his mercy, and I found that he comes through with his promises. Let me just opine for a minute. I've been in this business a while, 44 years. I've watched fathering and mothering, parenting over the last 30 years, and I've seen an interesting social um, effect. Way back, I, I remember when the self-esteem thing was priority, and we really poured tons of that into the lives of our children to the point of risking narcissism, if I may say so. And then as time went on, I saw parents slide in a different direction, which was almost from helicoptering to abandonment, so that our kids are almost told, you know, go figure it out for yourself, which they will, but they won't necessarily get it right. And so somewhere in the middle, my brothers and sisters, for those of us especially who are parents of young kids, and by the way, have you discovered moms and dads, it never ends even when they grow up? You're still involved in the parenting project, right? You're still involved that somewhere in the middle is a healthy place. I know sometimes people feel like, am I getting this right? Am I getting it wrong? Let me give you a little bit of encouragement, just kind of across the board. 25 years ago, David Blankenhorn wrote this book, Fatherless America. It was talking about a pandemic. And he's coming at it from a sociological perspective, so I don't want to get too distracted here. But I just want to point out how even people who think clearly see the benefit of healthy homes. Here's what he says in chapter 2 about fatherless society. Fatherhood is a social role that obligates men to their biological offspring. For two reasons, it's society's most important role for men. First, fatherhood more than any other male activity. Listen to this. Fatherhood more than any other male activity helps men to become good men, more likely to obey the law, be good citizens, to think about the needs of others. Put more abstractly, fatherhood bends maleness, in particular male aggression, toward pro-social purposes. Second, fatherhood, fatherhood privileges children. In this respect, fatherhood is a social invention designed to supplement maternal investment in children with paternal investment in children. We need both, moms and dads. That was the design. We're not an accident, by the way. We're not just a social construct. We're the result of creation. Indeed, last thing, 
Many anthropologists view the rise of fatherhood as the key to the emergence of the human family and ultimately human civilization. Where did my notes go? This is not good. <laughs> I've always said, moms, you're the civilizing influence in the home. Dads, when you respond, you nail it. It makes it work. Work together. It's an awesome, awesome and powerful thing. Just having men in the home makes a difference, the right men. And I think about my upbringing and, and what I had to learn. I had other role model men, and then some of them were in the church that just spending a few, time, a few minutes with a fatherless young man who was trying to find his way left an impact and a print on my soul that has lasted me to this day. Gentlemen, you're never done. Step up. There's so much to invest in the next generation. So I want to be able to give that to my children, whether they're spiritual or whether they're physical. And we want to talk about the good, good father that we have. Let me read this verse that's coming up in the book of Hebrews. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 12, 9 through 10. We had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? The humans disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. See, what happens in our brokenness is the trust factor toward this good, good father gets fractured. I was pondering the profound illustration that is found in the book of Hebrews. We've referenced this story before. Abraham is asked by God to take his only son that he loves and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. Can I encourage you to go read that story in the book of Genesis and just ponder that? As they're traveling, they go with their servants. Abraham says, you servants wait here. The lad and I will go and worship the Lord. And they take the wood for the sacrifice. There's no animal. Isaac and Abraham go on alone. They go to the mountain. And Isaac even says, uh, Dad, um, I have a question here. I mean, we're going to go worship, right? Don't we usually sacrifice a lamb and... The blood runs out and all of that happens when we worship the Lord. And where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide a lamb, my son. And he trustingly goes along. But we don't think more about that. Think about the Bible says Abraham binds his son's hands, lays him on the altar. I wish I could have seen this. Think of the trust and the love, as strange as this story is, there was something profound in that relationship of trust and love where this son models out and illustrates our Father in heaven who gives his son on our behalf. And thanks be to God, he rescues him at the last second. Abraham guessed right, the Lord will provide a ram for us, and he did. And so, as Hebrew said, he received his son back from the dead, just like the Father in heaven received our Savior, Jesus, back from the dead. A profound picture of father, son, love, and trust. That brings me to my last point. What is your good gift for your father? That's volitional. That's something you have to choose. God's done it all for us. What do we give back? What he looks for, what he delights in, is gifts that come, obedience that comes from the heart, because I love the Lord. I was thinking about that whole issue of uh, our, our gender sensitivity. When we sing that song, Beautiful One, I think I told you that I heard that song for the first time when I was at a conference for people who were struggling with gender identity, who were pressing in to the healing power of God, and that song stuck in my spirit. How many times males have ideas like doing dishes or laundry or feminine activities? Irrelevant. And for me to say, beautiful one, and God, I love you. And I remember Uncle Wynn, right, Kathy? Uncle Wynn used to pray, Jesus, the altogether lovely one, that I am completely secure in saying that. Why wouldn't I be? 
He's perfect. He's beautiful. He's beyond comprehension. And he has rescued us even though we don't deserve it. And so out of that, a response of love simply wants to give him obedience. I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in the truth. We can't pull it off by ourselves, but he's not left us alone. The last verse I want to share with you is Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's an intimate Aramaic daddy. My grandkids call me Pop Pop. That's who I am. <laughs> and it's intimate. It means daddy, father. He has sent the spirit of God into our hearts so that we walk in this father, son, daughter relationship and we can serve him out of a heart that wants to not just do the formality, but I want his pleasure. I want him to be happy with the good gift that I bring him. I don't know what has gotten in the way in your life. I wonder sometimes why I have to um, argue with people who profess faith to obey what Jesus says. Why do I have to argue with you about that? Is there something broken in your father, son, or daughter relationship that he needs to heal? Because either I'm not born again and I don't see the need, or there's something that's binding me up and I'm broken that needs to get fixed. Because I'm telling you, not only does he delight in it, when I get it right, it's joy inspiring for me as well and is for you. So may God bless you to do it. I'm going to close in prayer. Today, without being corny, God, I want to give you a happy Father's Day greeting. You're a good, good father, the great creator of heaven and earth. And we have, sang, we have sung songs about you being our vision. You are true father and I, your true son and daughter. Would you help us as we walk this path and give you pleasure and you bring that pleasure back to us because we scored. We gave a gift that gave our Father joy. Help us with this, we pray. Put your angels around our people. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great Father's Day, everybody.